All right. Welcome to lecture 28. This is chapter 7.2, Covalent Bonding. Now this is going to more describe covalently bonded molecules than how covalent bonds form. Yeah, covalent bonds forming is a complex and difficult subject. First, let's go ahead and start with covalent. Okay. It's because they're sharing, the atoms of the covalent bond are sharing their valence electrons. That's a V. Okay. So hence, covalent. So what happens is, you know, the two atoms will approach one another, and the atomic orbitals, you know, like the, uh, the actual orbitals that the electrons are living in, they merge, they mix, they change. Oops, change. And become molecular orbitals. And we're not really going to cover that here. Instead, what we're going to talk about is uh, some of the characteristics of covalent bonds, rather than how they form. And in later sections, we'll talk about covalently bonded molecules and what they look like. Uh, how covalent bonds form and why, that's more of a subject for Chapter 8. So now let's talk about polarity. Just because uh, the atoms on either end of a covalent bond are sharing electrons doesn't mean they share electrons equally. There's a thing called electronegativity. Uh, this is a property of an element. And it says it's talking about how much an element or an atom wants the shared electrons. Okay. Uh, it's related to... Uh, it's related to um, ionization energy and electron affinity. We talked about that back in uh, Chapter 6. Um, there are various definitions and methods for calculating um, uh, electronegativity. Uh, one of the most popular just um, looks at the strengths of covalent bonds formed by different uh, elements and then ranks them on an arbitrary scale from uh, zero to four. Okay. So the most electronegative element out there, you know, this is another trend. It, this is definitely an easy trend to remember. Um, because least down in this corner, most up in this corner. So fluorine is the most electronegative element. And the least electronegative element would be francium. So. Bing, boom, all right. Very, very straightforward. But the strength of the electronegativity of the two elements tells you what kind of bond you're going to get out of it. And uh, one of the methods I like to use to discuss this is the bonding triangle, or the electronegativity triangle. All right, so over here on the left-hand side, the vertical axis, that's uh, delta En, or the electronegativity difference between the two species involved. Okay. And obviously down here, bottom, that's just zero, because you can have two atoms of the same element brought together. And then this here, uh, the, uh, well, the horizontal axis down at the bottom, um, that is just the total electronegativity, the strength of the electronegativity. So this gives us the bonding triangle. We have this corner with zero electronegativity difference and very low electronegativity. Then we have this corner over on the right-hand side, zero electronegativity difference, but very high electronegativity. And then up here, up top in the middle, we have a very big electronegativity difference, and uh, electronegativity is in between. So we connect those three, 
And that's what gives us our triangle. So what do we find down here in the lower left-hand corner? Low electronegativity. These are things that don't want electrons. Things that don't want electrons are things that could lose electrons. We're talking about metals. So metallic compounds, metallic bonds. Low electronegativity, and it's low electronegativity difference because all the metals are low. Okay, so we're just talking about compounds that are very similar to one another. Now, things that have a high electronegativity and low electronegativity difference, we're talking about the nonmetals. So over here in this corner, we have our covalent compounds. Okay. So covalent means that because each atom really, really wants those electrons, they hold on to them tightly. They share them, but only between individual atoms. Whereas a metallic compound, they share them across the entire uh, metal. Okay, they don't really want those um, electrons. And in between, the high electronegativity difference, that means you're looking at a metal and a nonmetal. Up here in this corner is your ionic compounds. And what do we find in the middle? Well, that's where things get a little bit more complex. Okay. So now let's look at some numbers. All right. Here is um, a chart of electronegativities. Okay. So up here in the upper right, uh, you have fluorine, the most electronegative element, with its arbitrarily chosen 4.0 electronegativity. And then down in the lower left, you have francium, although because the table is tilted, it's um, over on the left-hand side of your screen. It has a, an electronegativity of 0.8. And thus we see that electronegativity just sort of generally increases going up or to the right across the periodic table. And the character of the bond, the sort of thing you're looking at, um, is it ionic, is it covalent, is it polar, and so on, is determined by the difference between the two things, the two atoms, on either end of your, uh, of your bond. So if the difference is really, really high, you're going to get an ionic bond. So that's going to be in between your nonmetals on the right and your metals on the left. If the difference is very, very small, it's going to be either a metallic or a covalent. And because we have actual numbers attached to these, we can put actual numbers on our uh, sort of chart. So we look at it and we say, OK, we have our electronegativity difference. What numbers are important here? 0 0.4 and 1.8. Okay. So that gives us three regions for, uh, to, for talking about our bonding. If it's less than 0 0.4, if the difference in electronegativity, this is, by the way, only talking about non-metal bonded to uh, non-metal. We are excluding metallic compounds. Okay. So in terms of the uh, bonding triangle, we're just on this arm, this side of the periodic of the uh, bonding triangle, going between ionic and covalent. All right. So we're sort of excluding uh, metallic compounds. They they always get left out. They're sad. All right. So if it's less than zero point four, okay, that means it is what's known as a pure covalent bond. Okay. There is such a small difference in electronegativity between those two elements that um, uh, there's no polarity to the bond. Okay, It's just we can treat it as the, the electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. Okay. If it's greater than 1.8, then it is an ionic bond. Okay. The, uh, the sharing has become so unequal that the more electronegative element has completely stripped the electron away from the other um, element, from the other atom. Okay. And in the middle, you have a polar covalent bond. Okay. That means the bond is polar. The electrons are still being shared between the two atoms but they're not shared evenly. They're not shared equally. Another word for a pure covalent bond is a non-polar bond. 
So when we look at a, um, you know, a polar versus a nonpolar bond, what are we looking at? Well, for example, you could have a, a hydrogen molecule or a fluorine molecule or an oxygen molecule. The elements on either side, the atoms on either end of the bond in this case, they're exactly the same. So for all of these, the electronegativity difference is zero, okay? which means that the electrons are all shared perfectly equally. They are nonpolar. But what about a polar bond? Well, there are plenty of those out there. For example, hydrogen fluoride or water or let's choose something that doesn't involve hydrogen. Let's look at uh, carbon tetrachloride. I'll explain all the symbols on that in, later in the chapter, later in chapter 7. Now each of these involves different elements being bonded together, and they have a significant electronegativity difference. Popping back over to our uh, chart there of electronegativities. We see uh, hydrogen is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5, fluorine is 4.0, chlorine is 3.0, uh, carbon is 2.5, 2 2.1, 3.5, 2.1, 2.5, 3.0. So because we have a nice significant uh, difference in electronegativities, the more electronegative element is going to be negative, the less electronegative element is going to be positive. But the sharing of electrons isn't that unequal. It is unequal, but it's not you know, a full taking of an electron. Okay? So we can't just represent it as a negative charge. That doesn't work. So instead, we have to represent it as a partial charge. Okay. And this symbol right here is another way of writing the Greek letter delta. Okay. Just like this triangle up here, that's a capital delta. This is a lowercase delta down here above the uh, fluorine. And that's a way of saying it has a partial negative charge. Okay. So it is negative, but it has less negative charge than an electron. Okay. So it's somewhere between zero and negative one. Okay. And the hydrogen has a partial positive charge. And in the same way, here in water, we have a partial positive charge on each of the hydrogens and a partial negative charge on oxygen. Coming over here to carbon tetrachloride, there is a positive charge on our carbon and a partial negative charge on each chlorine. It is possible to actually, you know, do some math, uh, you know, do the work and come up with the actual values for those charges, but we don't really need to do that. In the end, this is what we mean by polar bonds. We mean that one side is partially positive, one side is partially negative. So it has a positive end and a negative end, and we another way to represent it is like that. Okay, a positive sign pointing toward a negative sign, an arrow. That's a really messy version of that, though. So I'm going to scribble over that and do it again. Boom, just like that. Okay. So that's what polarity means: a negative end and a positive end on a bond. Right now, we're just talking about bonds. Uh, later on in the chapter, we'll get into polar versus nonpolar molecules. Uh, that is more complicated. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll hate it. Okay, so now let's look at uh, some of the pure covalent or nonpolar bonds. So one example of that would be methane, CH4. Okay, uh, carbon has a polarity, or sorry, an electronegativity of 2.5. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1. Okay. So the difference between those is 0 0.4, which puts it right there on the edge. And we consider these bonds 
non-polar. Okay. Carbon and hydrogen are close enough together in electronegativity that their bonds are non-polar. So that is where we get the various portions of the uh, bonding triangle. We have our electronegativity difference, we have the total electronegativity. Electronegativity difference goes from 0 to, I believe it's uh, 3.5. And then total electronegativity goes from 0 0.8 to 4.0. No, that's not 3.5, it's 3.2. I can be precise. Okay, so down here we have our metallic. Here we have our covalent, and up top we have our ionic bonds. So in between covalent and metallic, somewhere you know around here, we have our semiconductors. Okay, and down here we have our nonpolar or pure covalent compounds. And here, let's see, let's, oops. Here's where we have our polar covalent compounds. And here is just, you know, all sorts of messy. We tend not to uh, worry too much about the distinction between the metallic and the ionic in the same way. We mostly play around with uh, the polar, or sorry, the covalent and the ionic in uh, intro chemistry. Uh, metallic and semiconductors and things like that, that becomes more important uh, in advanced chemistry. They're fun, but not easy. All right. So what you need to take away from this for this section is, is that... Bond polar. Um, unless you really, really want to look things up and be precise, just ask yourself, are the atoms different? Okay. If it's two nonmetals and they're not the same element, go ahead and treat it as polar. Um, the only exception within... Yes. Okay. The only exception to that would be the carbon-hydrogen bond. That's the only one where you can really go ahead and say, um, just as a default, that it's going to be uh, non-polar, even with different elements. All right, uh, and that will do it for uh, uh, section two of chapter seven. I'll see you around.